Hi everyone, good afternoon and welcome to the latest uh, community engagement and system redesign webinar. So um, my name is uh, Chris Third, uh, my pronouns are he, him and um, I'm the chair for today's session. Um, I'll shortly introduce our speakers, but first a little bit of housekeeping. So um, just so that you're aware, um, the session is being recorded. Um, your cameras and microphones are on mute at the moment, but if you do have any questions, please um, remember to put those into the chat box. Um, and uh, and what we'll do is after the, pre the presentation is finished, we'll get on to questions then. Um, so you can also at that point put your hands up if you want to ask any questions there. And um, we'll be asking for um, feedback during the session as well. So we'll have a little bit of polls at the end. So um, please do stay to um, to uh, give us give us a little bit of feedback. Um, so I think that's everything I need to tell you about. Um, yep, yeah, I think so. Um, at the end of the session, once the session is completed, we will be uploading the recording onto our website. Um, so you'll be able to to view this again um, or share with colleagues if that is of interest. Um, if you do experience any technical difficulties, um, I think there should be my colleague's email address in the chat box there. Yep, I think that's been put in um, and uh, yeah, please just get in touch with them. OK, so without further ado, let's move on to um, our presentation for today. So first off, I will introduce um, Alison Bowes. So Alison Bowes is going to speak to us uh, first and then we'll have uh, Ro Pengeli as well. Um, to tell us a little bit uh, more about their role in this interesting project. So the project we're discussing today is designing homes for healthy cognitive ageing. Um, so I would uh, just like to pass over to Alison to um, introduce herself properly and um, take us through the next section of the um, session. OK, hopefully people can now um, see me. Um, thanks very much for um, turning up uh, this afternoon. I'm Alison Bowes. I'm a professor in sociology in the University of Stirling, and I've led the DESHKA project, which stands for Designing Homes for Healthy Cognitive Aging. Um, this is a, a three year research project that started in 2021 and finished at the end of February um, this year. So it's just at the stage of finalising the outputs and waiting for the journals to come back on the um, publications. Uh, I'm going to do the presentation with my colleague Ro Pengeli, who uh, was a member of the team as a community researcher. There's quite a large uh, team located here at Stirling and also in the University of Warwick, um, who are all described on our website. So um, without further ado, can we have the next slide, please? OK, so the aims of the project are set out on um, this slide and I'll just explain a little bit about them. So we're interested in working out what we can do about housing and particularly about people's homes in the community to make it more supportive for living well with cognitive change. Um, we're quite deliberately talking about cognitive change so that we um, cover all of us as um, we age. We're all likely to experience some level of cognitive change as we go through uh, older age. For some of us, unfortunately, that may become dementia. For many of us, uh, it won't. But the houses that we're talking about are designed to support everybody. So in addition to supporting people experiencing cognitive change, they'll also support people experiencing physical uh, impairment and uh, sensory uh, issues. In Deshka, it was it was really important that the homes that we came up with really suited people as they age that were um, pleasing and attractive for people to live in and that felt like home. Um, secondly, it was very important that the homes were practical, affordable and scalable for the housing sector, both people who design and build homes and also people who provide homes. So across the spectrum of um, private and social housing. 
And thirdly, it was very important that these designs were suitable for both newly built and uh, existing homes. And I'll come back to that issue uh, in particular. So Deshka aimed to design and test homes in collaboration with stakeholders. Um, that's a very short phase covering um, a huge range of uh, activity, as you will see. And at the end of that activity, our aim was to produce guidance to help all kinds of stakeholders make decisions about homes, um, both ourselves as we age and also people working in the housing sector. So next slide, please. Um, the research was conducted as a very collaborative piece of work um, throughout. Um, this slide just indicates the range of partners that um, we had. And you'll see we had partners from across the housing sector, social housing, private housing, uh, and also across the uh, construction sector, if you like, from uh, architects um, through uh, builders as well, and uh, eventually through people who administer um, aspects of the sale of housing, which some of our builder partners um, did. Um, we also have uh, international partners who've provided a kind of uh, objective lens, if you like, giving us advice on how to develop designs that will have wider uh, appeal. Um, we've also worked with a gaming company, and the reason for that will become apparent as uh, we go through. Um, in terms of generating the outputs from the project, a particularly important partner has been um, Clap Manager Council, and I'll, I'll come back to that again, as, as I say. So next slide, please. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, this slide illustrates all the different research methods that we used in the project and all the different um, data sets that we collected. Uh, you'll be relieved that I'm not going to go through uh, all of them in detail, but I hope that this um, slide illustrates the kind of quantity and variety of data that we've been using to inform our designs. So we've had, for example, um, secondary analysis of large um, data sets, which involves a lot of very complex um, number crunching. We've done interviewing work with um, different people, particularly um, professionals. We've uh, collected survey data regarding outcomes and the state of people's current homes. And uh, we've talked to older people, and this is under creative mapping, about how they use their homes now, what they like about them, what they don't like, what they might change, what they might not uh, change. And we've also developed in the bottom right hand corner uh, a serious game. You'll see as we go through how each of these um, became um, relevant. So next slide, please. As we all do, we need to start with the existing state of knowledge. So we identified a few shortcomings in existing work that are really important because we hope that we've moved on um, from these. And um, we found that uh, earlier work tended to focus on um, sing single items, a particular innovation, a particular piece of technology, rather than thinking in a holistic way about um, home design. So we tried to move away from that. Uh, we found that uh, earlier work gave us really little understanding of the costs or the business aspects of delivering cognitively supportive um, homes. Um, this is really important because we, we find often that people's gut reaction is it's terribly expensive. So it's been really important for us to work through that actually it isn't nearly as expensive as people think. It may cost a little more in some respects, but not as much as the stereotypes may suggest. Um, also, earlier work tended to homogenise older people as though older people are a, a, a kind of one category, which is basically homogenous. And very little attention had been paid to the diversity and the different wants and needs of us as uh, we age. Uh, we found there was an emphasis on rather small scale innovation, so people might look at um, one small development, but they rarely considered 
um, scalability, that is delivery at the scale that actually society needs, given um, the rate at which population ageing is uh, occurring, and given the increase in cognitive challenges that people are, are, are facing. Um, most of the outcomes that were considered um, in, in research, and this is uh, research outcomes, you know, did it increase well-being, did it prevent falls and things like that. Most of these are researcher defined and quite narrow, and they tend to miss the, the quite complicated picture that emerges when you look at things qualitatively and in detail, which involve understanding both positive and potentially negative effects of environmental changes for us as we age uh, cognitively. So next slide, please. I'm going to run through a few really key findings that have fed into our uh, outputs, which I'll come to uh, a little bit later. Obviously, it's really hard to do justice to the whole project in uh, a short time and hopefully not too many slides, although I recognise they've got quite a lot of words on them. Um, so forgive me for that. But um, what I've picked out are the things that are really important in terms of informing the outputs, as I say. And if you want to follow up more, then we are publishing. And there's also lots of information on our website, which summarises the findings of each part uh, of the project. So firstly, we can think about the, this, this issue of outcomes. I said that other people had um, done researcher defined outcomes. We did a whole lot of work designed to ascertain what outcomes were important to people as they age and also to um, the sector, very broadly defined. And we did bring in, when we were discussing this, people beyond the specifically housing sector. So we had uh, OT input, for example, health visitor uh, input, council officials uh, input and, and, and so on and so forth. So we did uh, quite a lot of work trying to identify these and the, the key ones that we've really identified are, first of all, maintaining independence, secondly, staying physically active and thirdly, enjoying preferred activities. Now, each of those within it, of course, says a lot. You know, what does maintaining independence mean? Well, different things to different people. And in many ways, that's that's the point. Um, people want to. Uh, maintain independence in the way that they find is possible and desirable um, for themselves. So each of these is very um, complex and uh, we can uh, unpick them uh, if we want to through uh, detailed scrutiny of, of our data. Um, we also find, and this is not really surprising, I guess, that uh, in order to bring about the kind of scaled change that we would like, and in order to deliver housing, which is going to be fit for purpose in the future with the ageing population, with um, the kinds of challenges that individuals face, but also with uh, sustainability challenges uh, as well, we need change at multiple levels. A really key part of that includes awareness raising for older people themselves, and people as they age, so not just people who fall into the older category, but people who are on the way there, let's say. Uh, awareness raising for the housing sector is critical. We need to get these issues discussed in professional education. And we may, in the end, be changes to legislation and um, policy. Although, of course, it's much preferable if people decide for themselves, yes, we want this, and then it happens because of that rather than um, because of having to wield um, big sticks. And I'm not pretending to be Liz Truss. Uh, OK, so some of the things that we know from talking to uh, older people are listed here. Something that came through very strongly and which is obvious when you think about it, but not obvious when you look at the literature is that as we go through life, we make changes to our homes. Um, we do that both proactively, things that we want to do, things that we uh, aspire to, things that we prefer, 
and reactively in response to things that may may happen to us say somebody breaks their leg and can't go upstairs so we have to somehow organize a downstairs bathroom we make these changes across the lifetime and uh, we do them in ways that enable us to live the lives we want that enhance quality of life and that in the end can support aging in place so it's not that you get old and then you change your house it's that people are doing this continuously and we can think of um, building homes or making homes for to support cognitive aging as really part of that process and something that can happen uh, across uh, a long period of time not something that happens when somebody falls off a cliff edge which is uh, what tends to happen in many cases in in the world out there just now um, we find secondly that people in making these changes in making the choices are, are constrained and uh, every, every change that they want to do is in a sense a question of balancing the benefits of making the change with the challenges that the change can present so these challenges might be stress obviously their disruption depending how big um, things are and uh, they may also involve um, expense as well as a significant challenge so that means that people are making choices and negotiating their way through possibilities. And I think we would say that, therefore, the more information they have about what's a really useful change and what might be less useful, the better. Um, we also find, and this is really neglected in the literature on ageing and um, care in older age, in housing and, and uh, older age, the home is a significant social space. It continues to be that as we age. Uh, it's not, again, that we get old and suddenly a, a, a house is just a place where we are and nobody comes, nobody goes and we don't do anything. Um, I think this has become increasingly recognised during and after COVID-19, um, where all the reporting reinforces the message that the home is much more than just a place for maintenance as the caricature I just presented suggests it's a place where um, people are active and uh, involved um, when we're thinking about the uh, housing sector there are some important findings again that come through um, the first of these is that um, the process involved in building, retrofitting and providing housing are incredibly complicated. There are lots of different people involved, lots of different interests, lots of competing agendas, perhaps. And in that context where professionals are fa facing difficulties uh, every day as they work through a project, ensuring cognitively supportive housing can seem to be just another challenge. Oh, no, not another thing. And it's very easy to neglect. It's something we found that quite even though people set out at the beginning of a project to make the housing cognitively supportive, uh, it's something that easily falls off the table as uh, the project works through, as the budgets are uh, adjusted and so on and so forth. So that suggests it's a massive challenge and there isn't much you can do. Actually, there is because we also found that amongst many of the professionals who were involved in our work, and I absolutely acknowledge they were kind of self-selected because they needed to be interested, but there is appetite and demand for housing that supports healthy cognitive ageing. And this is especially so amongst social housing providers um, people may know that uh, in Stirling we have a, a design service where we advise people on building dementia friendly uh, homes and uh, other kinds uh, of buildings. And many of these are uh, organized, many of those interested are organizations that provide uh, social housing or our local councils building community facilities and so on. So there's interest and demand out there that we can hook into and join up with and um, support. Interestingly, however, and this, this emerged um, during our design process, which I'll go into uh, in a minute, um, professionals in the sector often say that 
they wouldn't like to live in the supportive housing that they design themselves. So we'd go through a whole discussion and they'd say, oh, you need this, you need that, do this, do this, move that, you know, shift this, repaint that and so on and so forth. And then we just kind of gently ask in a group discussion afterwards, well, would, would you live in that house? And very, very often the answer was, oh, no, not for me. That's for an old person. And we want to get away from that. We want to think of this housing as something that is part of the lifetime movement through homes that everybody experiences. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the really key things we did in the project was to go through a process of co-design of uh, a new home. And we did this using um, VR, virtual reality headsets. Um, we started off with um, a, a kind of prototype that we developed in a, in a pilot project. And we went through several rounds of showing this prototype to stakeholders and getting them to comment on it. And then when we got the comments, we collated them and we modified the design and then went back and, and showed it again. So we did this around about three rounds, uh, I think, yes, three rounds. And we built in cognitively supportive features from the get-go. So it wasn't that the participants were, were suggesting this is a cognitively supportive feature. They were suggesting better ways of presenting the cognitively supportive feature so that it would be uh, appealing and that um, the home would be something that people actually would want to live in, despite what I just said. So this work focused our minds on a number of um, key points. Um, the first of these, as uh, I've already indicated, was that, of course, people's needs evolve and change through the lifetime. Um, this, this goes through the whole lifetime. It includes um, the process of um, getting older and as people get older the change continues so again it's getting away from this idea that there's somehow a cliff edge between not being old and being old and therefore having um, care needs or being dependent or all these kinds of stereotypes um, it, it appeared from the process that um, newly built homes could quite easily adopt inclusive design that can support people with quite uh, diverse needs. The, the matter of diversity I already mentioned when I was talking about the uh, earlier literature, not everybody's the same, not everybody needs the same thing. So when you're using inclusive design, it needs to be done in a way that makes it flexible and adaptable for people's different um, needs and wants. That's the newly built. So then the third point is about um, existing homes. And it's very clear that in uh, existing homes, it's very easy, as I'll show, to incorporate quite small changes that make a big difference uh, in terms of support for um, cognitive impairment, a uh, use of contrast can be brought in whenever the home is being redecorated, which all homes are quite regularly. Um, if somebody's um, revamping the kitchen, making uh, cupboards that you with, with glass doors is quite useful. It gives visibility to what's in there. People can see where the teapot is, things like that. You can use labels. There's all sorts of really small things that anybody can do, many of which cost either cost nothing or cost no more than what you would be doing anyway. So flexibility is absolutely key to accommodating personal preferences and varying um, needs. And a lot of the feedback that we got on the designs was about aesthetics. And you might think, well, that, that's that's superficial, that's not really important. But actually it's incredibly important. We We want our houses to feel like homes. We want to uh, enjoy living in uh, a place in which many people take a lot of pride, which holds a lot of rem uh, memories, which has uh, an element of um, comfort in it, in which we want to conduct our, our social activities. We also don't want to be labelled as uh, an older person with needs. Here comes the subtlety. 
So um, very visible aids and adaptations were incredibly unpopular. And um, I'm sure some people in the audience will have heard of this kind of thing happening, that somebody's given some uh, grab rails, for example, and they remove them because they don't like them. Uh, this is defeating entirely the object of trying to support people. Um, we continue to find in the VR exercise that um, the issues of scalability, both in retrofitting and new build, had been uh, neglected. So from the co-design, we learn quite a lot about what these designs should look like. Um, next slide, please. So all of this work, all of those findings are fed into these um, key outputs. Um, so I'm going to just alert you to what these outputs are like and how they reflect the collaborative approach that, that we've taken. So um, first of all, obviously, we do lots of conferences. We do lots of um, knowledge exchange and professional training. Uh, events and in, in due course there'll be materials on our website which are just free to use people can um, download them and take them into um, uh, events as uh, they go uh, we also have on our website a series of uh, legacy resources um, the first one is depicted in the top right hand corner of this um, this this slide and this is our most successful so far um, we called it Tips and Tricks for Creating a Home that Supports You, and it's designed for um, the ordinary person. It can also be used by a professional advising somebody. Anybody uh, can use this. It's produced from what we know about um, cognitively supportive design. And from feedback from um, particularly our, our older People's Reference Group and our community researchers about how to present this material. So I mentioned that people don't like to be labelled. So seeing something that says, um, here's how to get your home to support you cognitively as you, as you gradually lose your marbles. Not that it would ever be called that, but that would be the kind of message that certain titles can give. People would much rather have what my um, somewhat younger colleagues call hacks. So this is a book of hacks and what it does is take people through their own home and give them ideas to think about when trying to ensure that their home is as supportive as it can be. And as I indicated at the beginning, it's not confined to cognitively supportive features. It also includes physically supportive things and um, things that can support people with um, hearing or sight uh, issues, so sensory uh, issues. Um, we have a demonstrator, and I'm going to skip that, Chris, and come back to it in a moment. Um, Chris in the background is going to support this. Um, we've developed a serious game, which is a, a simulation game designed to support decision making about homes and this can be in existing homes or in new homes it can be played by anybody an ordinary person in their home or a group of professionals thinking about making a new development or somebody trying to learn about um, how to think through a cognitively supportive um, home design and we found it's been um, very successful in getting people to think in getting them to think differently and in getting them to work through the decisions that they make. So in the game, somebody makes a decision about a house and they're presented with a vignette, which is derived from our research findings of a real person to whom something has happened and they can see the consequences of the decision that they made for that person when something goes quite badly wrong as it, as it often can. So that will be available in an online version in due course on the website. And um, if people are interested in the actual physical game, please, please get in touch. Um, we have a, a design brief document for professionals. Um, this includes um, or will include professional drawings for professionals. We're just sorting through a few IP issues before it goes up on the website, but it will be um, available and 
uh, it's something that we hope people will work with. And we also have produced a guide to assessing costs and benefits. Actually assessing costs and benefits is really complicated. Um, this is a suggestion about how people might want to work through it when they're perhaps trying to convince um, a local authority or a member of their family that the changes they want to make are um, worthwhile. So I'll come back now to the, the demonstrator. This is uh, an online um, facility and it's not a recipe. It's an illustration of one way that a home might incorporate cognitively supportive um, design features. So Chris is going to take us there and I'll guide you through just for a couple of minutes so you can see and you can look at it on the website. Um, again, we will have a, a version that's downloadable to a VR headset. So if we can press begin. We should enter the house. Ah, there we are. There it comes. OK, so it's it's a one storey design, so it could be a bungalow or it could be an apartment. Um, throughout, there are these little spots and each of these little spots has a little bit of um, information. So, Chris, if you could kick on, click on one of the spots. There we go. Um, I'll maybe read it because it's a bit small. It says the usability and space efficiency of shelves and cabinets can be optimised and future proofed by prioritising towards the ergonomic needs of wheelchair users and others with limited mobility. So good ways to provide plenty of storage. Lots of people need storage. You can never have enough, uh, was repeatedly said in our in our workshops. Maybe come out of the thing now, Chris. That's it. Um, in this particular illustration, this is a hall cupboard with sliding doors and inside it is a bike. It could be a wheelchair. This is just an illustration of the different ways that such. Um, such a facility might be used, so if we could zip down a little bit to the left, Chris, and kind of go around the hall. That's it. You'll see that there are little spots uh, everywhere. Indicating how the design features are specifically thought through um, to be helpful. So one example would be that seat in the hallway. Incredibly useful. You can equally well have a chair. It's the idea of having a seat in the hallway is what we want to um, put across. So if we go back into the hall, Chris, and go right into the kitchen. You have to click the arrow to go in. Oh, there we are. OK, so we now, if you think we're, we're looking into a lounge, but we're standing in uh, a kitchen. Could you just turn around the kitchen now so that people can see? Chris, nice outside space. This is set up for a wheelchair user with um, a reduced height um, sink and, and hob as well, which, which isn't yet visible at the moment. It doesn't have to be like that. Um, we've got, yeah, there's the hob and you can see on the hob um, an interesting way of indicating which knob operates which ring. I think that's something that really every hob should have. I don't know if anybody else finds them as confusing as I do, but they are, I think they're inherently confusing. So actually sorting that one out might, might help really everybody. If we can go a little bit to the left, Chris. That's it. Right, so in, in some of the rooms we have alternatives. So where there's an eye, if you click on the eye, Chris. Thank you. There's a different kitchen. It's the same kitchen, actually. It's got the same features, but this one is set up for a non wheelchair uh, user. It illustrates the same design features. So there's an easy to use tap, for example. We've got the same easy used to use hob somewhere else. We've got um, cupboards with um, glass fronts so you can see what's inside and so on and so forth. So um, do have a look at this and have a browse through and read the little spots uh, and things and hopefully it can be a useful resource. One thing we did find in the VR workshops and this was said by the professionals was that um, when professionals show people a drawing 
they find it really, really difficult to understand and to visualize. And they said, if we've got this this video um, walkthrough thing, people are giving actually much better feedback because they understand much better what the issues might be. So somebody might look at this and go, actually, I'm really small. I don't think I can reach those top cupboards. And the designer can then say, well, actually, we can incorporate a drop down shelf so you can open the cupboard because the bottom of the handle isn't very high up. And then you can kind of hook the shelves down, which people will have seen is a feature that exists in 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 many modern kitchens. Um, the appearance of this as quite nice, as something you might want to live in, is important. Also, the appearance of it as ordinary is important. So this isn't high end expensive tech. This is the kind of thing you can buy in Wix or Howden's. And I'm not advertising either of those, by the way, but I'm saying in an ordinary kitchen showroom, you would be able to find most of this um, stuff. Very little of it is in any way specialist. So I think perhaps we'll leave the house now. So, well, I'll maybe just talk to the next slide while we wait for it to come up. And this is a slide about how we brought the, the co-production in. So it was done in a number of different ways. One way was um, working with the uh, partners, as I described, so delivering the VR design, um, developing the serious game. Another way was working with the older people's reference group and the community researchers who were really important, critical friends throughout the project and who I have to acknowledge made a magnificent contribution. And I'm including Ro here, so um, I hope I don't want to embarrass her. Um, I want to hand over to Ro, who's going to talk a little bit about um, what what that was like and what they felt they were able to uh, contribute. Thank you, Alison. Um, yes, I was uh, on the project as an unpaid retired citizen interested in how citizens can, can, can co-produce with universities so to feed into research and teaching. Uh, so I was just a sort of interested outside observer. My citizen's perspective of Deshka is that it did forge incredibly good working relationships with citizens, but it did at the beginning make uh, a little bit of a hash, give, offering too many options and making a few promises that we weren't able to finish, but not very many. Um, its powerful literature search was amazing because it proved really early on that you can do ever so much design, ever so much policy, but in fact, change has to be incentivized. It really does. Um, and we can sort of pull, push out document after document saying how wonderful things would be, but it's actually got to be incentivized. The serious game is fantastic because it actually uh, enables people to see, uh, to think through options in particular circumstances, and it helps professionals uh, with their othering, which Anson did mention, which is just how they do actually look at something professionally and then they have another opinion. Uh, personally, which is not rocket science, but is the case. And I feel that Deshka will help uh, individuals and this will help OT, so I'm happy. But there's a but, and that is that NHS and social care already do see that they have a recruitment problem because of housing. And I don't think that they actually realize, NHS and social care realize just how much extra work is already happening because of housing being ill-matched to what we need um, and one of the reasons for that is that there will be a rising instance of flash floods and heat waves so therefore asthma and there are very few relocation options now okay there's no relocation op op options for workers but also there if we want to right size is it's extremely difficult um, so people are being left in unsuitable houses increasingly unsuitable houses and they're unsafe and they're getting more isolated and uh, being surrounded by short lets doesn't help. I mean, really, really does cause isolation. The other thing is that older people are also unpaid carers and there really is incredible worry out there where people with special needs will be able to live, um, you know, perhaps in, in uh, uh, I know that there are some complexes, but it's the, it's the amount of, of property which is really needed. Um, and, 
uh, I would suggest that the housing issues can't actually be um, resolved solely by social housing as 58% of, of housing is actually private. So a conclusion from a systems perspective is that if we could actually crack um, the uh, make progress on the uh, relocation uh, option side, um, I think that easing adaptations and relocations would actually stem sofa surfing and homelessness. It would do it would go some way towards it. And yes, sofa surfers do include older people who can't relocate because if you can't move to be close to family and friends, then uh, you're just increasingly isolated. So I would uh, plead for a collaboration that actually proves the case to Treasury, to government, to how to incentivize uh, housing development. And by that, I mean new build and reuse of old property and adaptations and upgrade. Um, and the one other thing was that the Desco project did inform the Age Scotland uh, report. And uh, that again underlined that it's fantastic to speak about design, it's fantastic to speak about policy, but in the end, you actually have to incentivize it. So thank you for the experience, Alison. <laughs> Um, forgive me, I'm, somehow I've got control of these slides. I'm just trying to move along to the next one. Um, yeah, so we have a series of um, recommendations coming out of the project, which I'll very quickly um, run through. Um, we'd like to see healthy cognitive ageing included alongside support for physical and sensory issues in plans to uh, improve our housing as we age. Um, we'd like to change the language. Um, you may have noticed I've been doing that as I've spoken. I've said quite often as we age and here I'm saying as we age, we may change our homes. This is about all of us. It's not just about uh, some other population of people who are different just because they're older. Um, there's a need for increased awareness to increase demand. Um, we need to think about both big things and small things. That's what I mean by principles and features. So big things designed for to support um, cognitive aging, small things, more contrast in the home, um, more even toned floors, things like this. Lots of people can do those and implement them without too much difficulty. We'd like a consideration of the total social, social costs, not just the narrow budget. So um, as everybody in the audience will know, if people fall over less, which cognitively supportive homes will uh, ensure, then that's less demand on the NHS and then subsequently on social care. So the total cost to society of doing this is, is very little compared with um, the savings that can be identified. We need to link uh, sustainability of environmental sustainability and ageing. Uh, if we don't do that, we're on a hiding to nothing. We can't be proposing um, developments which are not environmentally sustainable. Older people and professionals need to work more closely in, in partnership. Amazing things happen um, when they do. And the end result, we hope, is to enable us all to age in the right place, which is going to be different for different people, and to live the lives we want. So thank you very much for um, listening and please do uh, have a look at uh, our website if you're able and contact us if you would like further information. So I'm now going to press the stop sharing button and cross my fingers. Yep. Yeah, thanks Done very it. much, Alison, <laughs> and thanks, Ro, as well, for that um, wonderful presentation. So it's been really good to um, hear from both of you. Um, and um, we've, we've got those technical hitches. There's always a technical hitch. We've got that figured out anyway. Um, but I do see there's a lot of questions in the chat box. So I think, Jackie, are you going to give us the, the first question from there, please? And please, please do feel free to raise your hands if you want to ask a question in person as well, and we'll we'll turn on your your mic and camera. 
Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, I'll just start at the very first question. We'll work through as many as we can in the time. Um, mm -hmm. Just keep me right, Chris. So we had Francis um, asking the first questions of, of do you have a oh, excuse me, do you have a blueprint for new homes? We have our walkthrough design. It's I wouldn't say it's exactly a blueprint, although, of course, we'd love it if all new housing for older people was built like that. But um, we have the um, demonstrator which indicates possibilities and options that um, can support people. Not everybody will be able to do everything, but a lot of people will be able to do something. Thanks, Alison. Francis also followed up that question um, with how can you help us build some new homes on Sandy in Orkney? <laughs> <laughs> We'd absolutely love to um, get involved with that. If you if you want um, professional design support, please contact the Dementia Services Development Centre at Stirling, and my architect colleagues provide uh, a service to support people interested in developments. Or you can look at the Deshka materials and, and use them. Thanks, Alison. Um, next question is from Edmund. Um, he's asking on the design and features developed by the project, are there examples or prototypes available to view? Uh, you can see them in the uh, the demonstrator. Um, we do have uh, elsewhere resources which list potential uh, examples. We also have through our um, DSDC some accredited products. Um, we don't recommend anything in particular, but we have assessed some particular products for the, particularly their dementia um, supportive uh, nature. Okay, thanks, Alison. And um, there was a little bit of, well, there was a lot of interest about the serious game. Um, Nigel uh -huh. was interested <laughs> in that. Um, Julie, I think Rose maybe actually answered this. Julie Miller was asking, can staff play serious game with someone newly diagnosed with dementia to help or initiate thinking about where they live? And I think Rosemary said yes, that would yeah. assist with that. Yeah, that's definitely yeah. that's that's one potential use of it. And, you know, it can operate at different levels so we can make it more simple or more complicated or more comprehensive, less comprehensive, etc. Yeah. That's great. Um, Elsa said the colour coded hob is a fantastic idea that got quite a bit of love there yes. with um, Julie asking who supplies these. <laughs> don't know if you know that, the answer to that. We don't, we don't recommend um, particular uh, suppliers. Um, to be honest, I think we may need to develop that. But it's so blindingly obvious how brilliantly useful it would be for everybody okay. that, you know, if there's a company out there who'd like to work with us and develop it, please come and knock at the door. Wow, brilliant. OK, so um, I think there's maybe a little bit more to love of that a little bit later on. But in the meantime, <laughs> we've got Edmund again asking, while, while there may be upfront costs associated with implementing these designs, did the project consider any potential long term savings? such as reduced need for modifications or healthcare yeah. interventions later in life? Absolutely, definitely. And um, I think what, what I was saying at the end about, say, the costs of a fall, it, you know, somebody falls and breaks their hip, it's, it's absolutely colossal. If they had, you know, a short time earlier, taken out the dark doormat off the light floor, which looked like a hole and caused the person to trip up, if that had been done, which involves picking a doormat up off the floor, you know that you can make immense savings it's it's not hard to make that um argument and of course um the the funding bodies need arguments like that so hence our um costs and benefits advice um so i'm just making sure i've not missed a question okay. there we had Dave, we're talking about the serious game again. Can you clarify, yeah. is serious game for new build properties only, or can it be used in properties yeah. that the person already loves it? Yeah. A lot of shaking of heads. We've we found its best use is actually in the properties people are already living in. 
So the first step is that people map an existing house. And then they get the vignette, something happens, so they modify the existing house. And then something else happens, so they look back at the modifications. Was that the right thing to do? Was that the right choice? It, it operates like that. And um, lots of the play tests, Ro, weren't they? They were about um, people's existing homes. I think you and I played it together with our existing homes, actually. But it, but it also challenges you by giving vignettes of uh, people to to make you think about what, how you could change something given a different circumstance. It does, it's not very clear, but yes, it does. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Rosemary and, um, and Alison. Um, next question we have is from Una. And apologies if I pronounce any of these wrong, but Una, I think, is right. Una's asking, has this work links with intergenerational network, as there seems to be common ground, including the need for outdoor environmental issues for access and safety? Mm -hmm. um, yes, we do. We, we specifically linked with, with that group. And we're also currently doing some work on thinking about the design from an intergenerational perspective. So we mostly looked at it with older people in Deshka, but we'll be looking at it with some multi-generational groups in, in the near future, actually, as part of some, some other work. Um, next question, it was more of a, if it's a gas cooker, perhaps much more easier solutions change the hob, so more love for this colour coordination. <laughs> um, Louise Wheeler is asking, I think this is much is such an important area of work to support people who require appropriate housing to meet their needs. I have concerns how much this can be invested with the, within the mm -hmm. current financial climate yeah. and wonder how to demonstrate longer term mm -hmm. benefits. But thank you for sharing. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I I mean there's 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 different strategies, I suppose, for making the argument. One is around the the what I said about the total social costs at the at the end. Think about the big picture, not just what the house costs. But I know that's easier said than done. Um, if the um, if if health, social care, and housing were able to work in partnership more effectively than they currently do, I hope I'm not stepping on anybody's toes there. <laughs> then I think that would be a whole lot more possible. And maybe one of the things the new national care service. Um, can do is facilitate that much better what is now cross-sectoral um, mm -hmm. working. Yeah, I know. And there are oh, there Alice, are constraints on budgets. Yeah, Alice, the road Ro thinks I'm an idealist, you see, which I am. But you don't have to prove the case. Yeah. You have to prove the case. Yeah, you do. No, it's you it's, have to it's, have savings. It's, it won't happen. Otherwise true. we've been talking like this for decades. Yeah. Yeah, no, I know that. And one of the things that did come through, for example, is that um, we uh, quite a few of the participants were people from housing associations and they, of course, have a fixed budget in which they have to deliver a certain kind of house. And um, initially they're going, oh, I've, I've only got a fixed amount of money. I can't do this. I can't do that. But actually, when they see how simple some of these things are, then and and they have a commitment to it actually it can be done within existing envelopes in, in surprisingly you can go a lot further than people think i would say which is why i referred to the very expensive stereotype at the beginning some of it some things are very expensive but painting a wall a different color isn't thanks alison and um, we have a question from edmund um He's asking beyond the home environment, are there recommendations for incorporating these design principles into communities to support healthy cognitive ageing? Yeah, there, there are. And again, through the DSDC, there's a lot of information about that and some examples of where they've um, used um, versions of these principles. Obviously, they're they're improving all the time, you know, as we get more and more understanding. But they've used them in advising, um, for example, on building community facilities, neighbourhoods, paths, networks, things like this. Yeah. Um, we've got a lot of questions, um, so I, I don't know, Chris, will that is it okay <laughs> I think to we've take got another time couple? For one more. Yeah, one, one more, more. I think. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so um, got a question from Morna. 
Um, oh, it may, this may be more of an, uh, a statement, sorry, I hadn't caught up with my question. <laughs> this is exactly what health and social care partnerships and local authorities should be thinking about. As Alison has pointed out, this kind of adaptation, whatever the cost, will save the NHS money in preventing falls and accidents mm. at home. So yeah. obviously resonating with people, what you're saying, Alison and Ro. So and it's still got, yeah. yeah, it's still got to be done in the private sector as well, because it can't yeah. be just the housing associations. So it's got to Yeah, no, the, the the volume builders need to do it. If I can maybe have one last word. We're currently working very closely with um Clack Manager Council to develop um, a much more sophisticated demonstrator of the principles which we're doing as part of the city region deal so bringing in businesses who want to demonstrate products for example rolling out training to other sectors where it's important that people understand this so for example kitchen designers were not involved in our, our um, project very closely and um, more will follow so I hope people will just keep an eye on the website for developments over the next few months. Thanks. Yes, can Thanks I just ask one quick question? Because oh, I think there, it, it's real. Hopefully it's just a yes, no answer because yeah. there's been quite a lot of questions. So is, is the serious scheme available? Um, it will shortly be available in an online version on the website. If you want to play it in a room, please contact us. Okay, that's great because there's a lot of questions on that so yeah sneak that in there thank you yeah. thanks <laughs> thanks jackie that's fine so we do have more questions in the chat box but i'm aware of time so um, what we'll do is we'll try and get um, those answered um, and posted on the website when we post the recording so we will post the this recording soon as well and um, you should hopefully see a few questions popping up on your screen um, and that's just a wee bit of an evaluation just to um, let us know how it's gone so thanks very much to everyone attending today and a special thanks to Alison and Ro, our speakers, for coming along today um, and um, sharing this with us. I think it's been really interesting. There's definitely lots of learning and lots of different angles that you can take on this one as well. So um, yeah, it's been a particularly good uh, good thing today. So um, that's it from us. Um, as I say, the recording will be posted on our website um, shortly and um, we do have previous version, uh, previous recordings of previous webinars as well on there. Um, so this will go into that um, that list. Um, and yep, yeah, thanks again for joining us today and have a good uh, rest of the day and rest of the week. Bye for now.